Hi, I'm Bake Adafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're going through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the Gospel of John in the New Testament. If you'd find your Bible and open it to John, we'll begin in just a moment. John is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson 58, and we're beginning with chapter 6 and verse 40. If you'd like to open your Bible there, we'll begin in just a moment. We have a free offer of a written Bible study for you entitled, Gospel Focus, The Necessity of a Pure Gospel. You can request your copy by emailing me at the address shown at the end of the lesson. Let's begin by reading John chapter 6, verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you uh, would bless this time as we study your word. Thank you for it. Thank you for each soul that's watching, and that they would receive a blessing from your word, that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to their souls and their hearts, that they might be drawn to you, Lord, we thank you for Jesus' deity, that he indeed was God, and that he showed over and over as he spoke uh, to these people in Capernaum um, the, uh, the evidence of his deity. And Lord, help us not to be like them and refuse him. Help us to put our faith there and our trust there to look to him. Help us to commit ourselves to him. Thank you for what you're doing in each life, Lord, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a 48-hour look. Uh, John chapter 6 is at uh, uh, 48 hours, two days in Jesus' life. And he's, he's um, fed 5,000 people on the first day, done miracles, healing, uh, prayed all night, uh, zoomed a boat across the water. The next day, he's now in Capernaum, and he's teaching in their synagogue there. And the people that he's speaking to are not receiving what he's saying. And we have grouped... Um, ideas together from verse 40 all the way down through uh, verse 71 of this chapter that are similar because there's so much repetition in the chapter. Jesus repeats himself over and over to these people and they still don't get it. Uh, but we've grouped them together uh, instead of taking it verse by verse like we, we normally would because there's such a repetition of these ideas. And uh, uh, the next idea that we're looking at is uh, that, of, that of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 40, which we read, um, uh, Jesus, um, Jesus ascribes to himself the capacity, the ability to raise people from the dead. In fact, to raise everyone that's ever lived from the dead. And um, there, there basically are two kinds of resurrection. You can be raised to eternal life, where you spend your life with the Lord Jesus in heaven, with God, or you can be raised to an eternal death, where you're separated from God and the object of, of God's wrath is poured out on, on you for your sins for eternity. And when we think of everlasting life, we're thinking of the first thing. We're thinking of being in heaven with the Lord Jesus. And that's what he's saying here about faith in Him. Um, everyone that sees the Son, he calls himself the Son and believes on him, he speaks of himself in the third person, <laughs> has everlasting life. You believe on the Son, which is me, and you get everlasting life, and I'm going to raise you up in the last day. In other words, I will raise you to eternal life on the last day. And this life is not the end for you. You will be raised to an eternity. So, um, the moment a person dies, well, uh, let's just look at... Um, well, let's go on and, and look at the other places he talks about. It's in verse 44. He says, No man can come to me except that the Father, except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repeated theme. I will raise him up. I'm the one that's going to raise up. You believe on me, you get raised up at the last day. And then verse 54 uh, says the same thing. 
Who, whoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you see how the ideas are repeated. That's why we're grouping them together. The resurrection of the dead is what Jesus is talking about, well, the idea that we're talking about now. And um, uh, Jesus presents faith in himself as equality with resurrection from the dead. You believe in him, you get raised up from the dead to eternal life. So uh, look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, this is a familiar story. It is um, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus was a beggar. He was laid outside the rich man's gate. He was full of sores. He was a pitiful sight. Uh, people would avoid him. He was begging. That's how he lived. People had to come and carry him wherever he needed to go. He couldn't motivate around. And, um, and he dies, and the man that owns the house, outside of which he begs, sits at his gate, also dies. And it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. So here's the two of them. They both die. This happens to everyone. Everyone is going to die. There are very few exceptions. There are some in the Old Testament of people who, who didn't die, who got taken directly to heaven. But everybody else that's ever been in the world dies. We all die. And it happens to us just like it happened to these two guys. Either the angels are going to come and get you and take you to heaven. You get an angelic escort up to the presence of God. Your spirit and your soul are directed to Him, taken to Him, or you flop down into hell. And the second option is not a good one for anyone. And verse 23 says, And in hell, that is, um, the rich man is in hell, he lifts up his eyes and he's in torment, seeing Abraham in a for, a far off and Abraham and, and, and Isaac and Lazarus in his bosom. So Abraham's in heaven. Abraham made it. Abraham was the first Jew chosen by God, an example of a life of faith. He believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. And, and, and we are supposed to follow his example. We are supposed to believe God um, about the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus and believe his words, do his commandments. And that's our eternal life. Um, he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom by his side. It, it, he sees him with him. And there's a conversation that ensues. But what we're pointing out by looking at this, it's just these two verses is, this happens to everyone. Everybody that hears my voice is going to die. It's going to happen to you. I mean, when you're young and you're you know, a teenager, you think you're immortal and you're invincible and nothing can hurt you and and you think you're going to live forever, and then as you age and get older, and aches and pains start to start happening, and you realize your mortality, you realize that there is an end coming to your life. Well, prepare for that end, because you're going to be like one of these two people. You're either going to be have an angelic escort to heaven, or you're going to flop down into hell and be there in torment forever. And you don't want to be that second, that second place Look at Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, this is a sermon that the Apostle Paul gave to Felix, who was a, a governor in defense of, his, uh, defense of his life. The Jews have um, trumped up a charge that he was in the temple, took a Gentile into the temple, which was against their law, and uh, they want him dead, and they've been hounding him and following him and accusing him. And, uh, hiring or orators to, to, to plead their case before uh, those people who could put him to death. And um, he's making this confession, and part of his confession is, is this in Acts 24, verse 15. And it says, And we have hope toward God, which stays them, th themselves also a lie, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So this is um, the Jews who were uh, biblical in their faith, knew that there was going to be a resurrection. The Pharisees believed this. Sadducees did not. And there was a conflict between the two of them. Paul used this fact of the, of the unbelief of the Pharisees in a resurrection and the belief of the Pharisees in one to set them against each other so that, um, so that he could um, be delivered from their hands. <laughs> but it was smart, really smart. And... Um, his defense against Felix is, I'm on trial here today for a hope that our nation uh, allows. Our, hope, our, uh, our nation uh, believes in this, that there will be a resurrection from the dead. 
This is a guy who saw the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus and heard him speak to him. He blinded him. He told him what he was going to do and how he was going to serve him. I mean, the resurrection of the dead is um, uh, proof that Jesus is who he says he says he is. Look at uh, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 25. There Jesus says, Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So, hearing the voice of the Son of God means you receive it, you accept it, you believe it. Um, some people hear, like these people in John chapter 6, and they aren't going to accept it. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, no thanks. Don't want any part of that. They don't understand, they don't hear, they're not comprehending. But those who do hear, when, when you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again at that point. You have eternal life. What was dead inside you toward God becomes alive. God comes and takes up residence inside of you. He lives within you. And uh, He opens the channel of communication between you and God. God's Word begins to make sense. You begin to, 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 to desire to pray and to read His Word. You begin to fellowship with other believers. You get baptized to show that your identification with His death and His burial and His resurrection. You hear His voice. And those that hear shall live. And then look at verse 28 and 29. Jesus says, Marvel not at this. You know, don't be amazed. <laughs> this is, this is a, a basic truth. Don't marvel at it. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. He's talking about Himself. Everyone is going to hear my voice. When He comes back, He's going to speak and everyone that's ever lived and, and, and died on this earth is going to hear His voice. Whether your body's been cremated or uh, placed in a nice uh, coffin made out of copper or coffin made out of wood or dumped in a hole with other bodies after a mass killing or eaten by the fish in the sea or whatever by, by whatever means your body was disposed of after you die, we're all coming back. We're all getting a new body. Uh, uh, an eternal body. We're going to hear His voice. And verse 29 says, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and then they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So there's two resurrections, like I said. There's one to life and there's one to damnation. There's the Lazarus that gets taken by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and there's the rich man that falls down into hell and is separated from God and under torment forever. And it's at the voice of the Lord Jesus that this happens. Some to the resurrection of life, some to the resurrection of damnation. Everyone will hear His voice. Turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, Jesus, His friend La uh, um, Lazarus has died. Uh, this is a different Lazarus, not the beggar. This is Mary and Martha's brother, Jesus uh, often stayed in their home, taught there. They were receptive to him. They were believers in him. And he found out that Lazarus was sick. He purposely delayed his coming to their home because he wanted Lazarus to die so that he could raise him from the dead. And in the process, before he raises him, uh, he has a conversation with Mary and Martha. And this is part of the conversation to Martha that he has. Martha says in verse 24, uh, I know, um, she says to Jesus, I know that he shall rise again, La Lazarus, her brother, in the resurrection at the last day. I, she believes in the resurrection of the last day. There's going to be a resurrection. She believes this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, he's going to speak and people are coming out of their graves and the resurrection you want to be part of is the one that where you go by the angels to heaven, where it's a resurrection to life instead of death. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I mean, he, this is a claim to his deity. I am the resurrection. I, everyone that believes on me, 
And the last day, I'm going to raise him up. I'm coming back. No, no longer a little baby in a manger uh, born where sh shepherds come and worship him. He's coming back in power. He's coming back uh, with a host of heavenly angels. He's coming back with authority and with judgment. He's coming back and raising everyone by his voice and, and speaking in all the graves are going to be opened and everybody is going to be reconstituted and he's going to judge the world in righteousness and give eternal life to those who've trusted in him in a, in a resurrected body. He is the resurrection and the life. So the resurrection uh, of uh, uh, believers is um, to life is part of his claim to deity to these people. If you believe in me, you get a resurrection unto life. Another claim uh, that Jesus has of, of deity that we see in John chapter 6, turn back there, is um, in verse uh, 43. Um, we're going to run through uh, three of these verses. He understands what the people that are around him are thinking. He understands what's going on in their hearts without them telling him outright. Okay? So this is part of the omniscience of God, part of his all-knowingness, that he knows everything. There's nothing that escapes his notice. Uh, look at verse 43. Jesus answered and and Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Murmur not among yourselves. They're complaining and murmuring. You know what murmuring is? It's, blah, 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 blah. it's under your breath. So the, the person you're complaining against really can't hear you. And, um, and, and, and really you, uh, you're, you're simmering inside. You're kind of boiling over inside. And you don't like what's happening. And you're angry and you're bitter. And you're murmuring against this person. Or it's not going the way that you want it to go. It's not going your way. And that's what's happening here. And Jesus understands this. And they're murmuring among themselves, to themselves. And he says, don't murmur among yourselves. How does he know this? He's omniscient. It's, it's God speaking when Jesus speaks. Look at verse 61. Um, he says there, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? So <laughs> he knows in himself what they're thinking. He knows they're offended by his words. Eat my flesh, uh, drink my blood. My flesh is meat indeed. My, my, my blood is drink indeed. Uh, uh, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They are offended in this. And, and he understands that. He knew in himself uh, that his disciples murmured against him. Look at verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. That's Jesus' words, end of his sentence. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. I mean, he, he chose Judas Iscariot uh, himself. And he knew that this guy is going to betray me. At the end of my life, when I'm arrested... Judas is going to lead them to me to arrest me. And he treated him with the kindness and love and, and, and care that he did his other 11 disciples. And in fact, he gave him charge of the money for the group. He held the bag, the scripture says. He, he controlled the money. They, they, they pooled their money together. And when, when they needed something, he had the money to buy it. Of course, he was a thief. That's why he held the bag. But Jesus knew beforehand uh, who it was that would betray him um, in verse 64. And um, he probably tells his disciples this um, so that um, they would, when it happened, they would be able to look back on it and remember that he said this so that their faith would not be destroyed, so that they would continue uh, to trust in him. Um, he knew who it was that was going to betray him. Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139, uh, we'll just read the verse seven verses of this psalm. I mean, this is a, um, a statement of God's omniscience, a statement of, 
um, there's nowhere for us to go to hide from God. There's no thought that we can keep back from Him. There's no, uh, no action that we can perform that He doesn't understand and see. He, he is everywhere and He knows everything. You got nowhere to hide is what this psalm is about. Oh Lord, it says, you have searched me and known me. God searches us. God knows us. You know my down sitting and my uprising. You know my every move. I can sit down. I can get up. You know all about it. You understand my thought afar off. He knows our thoughts. We saw it in John chapter 6. They murmured he knew it. He knew what was in their hearts. Um, he knew Judas would betray him. He knows that. You compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. So, you know, a compass of your path is you're surrounded by him. There's no place you're going to go that you're not with him or that he's not around you. And he's acquainted with everything that you're doing. All your ways, God knows all about it. Your thoughts, your actions, you're lying down, you're getting up, your travel, everything that you do. Verse 4, for there is not a word in my mouth, in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, you know it all together. So the words that we speak, he, kn he knows them before they come out of our mouths. <laughs> Who is this guy? I mean, fantastic. Um, extraordinary. You know, think about this. He knows that for you, every thought, every action, every motive, every word before you speak it, your path, everything that happens to you, sit down, get up, where you go. Not just you, but everyone. There's no one that escapes his notice. His computer is infinite. He records everything and he knows everything. There's no darkness with him. There's no place where we can run and hide and, and, and do our sin in darkness because he's everywhere and he knows everything. You have beset me, I mean surrounded me, kind of hemmed me in a little bit, behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Um, you know, direction. God gives direction in our lives. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high. I cannot attain unto it. So uh, the circuit breakers in my mind explode and blow when I try to consider God knowing everything just about me, but about everybody, and knowing it completely. I mean, who is this God with which we have to do? I mean, shouldn't we be bowing down and worshiping Him, our Creator, the sustainer of our lives, the one who's going to speak and everyone's going to come out of the graves, some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation? We need to to acknowledge this. We need to to worship Him. We need to come to Him. And then he says, Where shall I go, verse 7, from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? And this is rhetorical. Rhetorical questions are easy to answer because the answer is obvious. Where are you going to go to escape from God? And the answer is you can't. There's no place to go. You can't escape His spirit. You can't escape His presence. He is everywhere, and He knows everything about you even your words before you speak them. This is the omniscience of the Lord Jesus. This is the claim that he's making to these people. I mean, can you imagine talking to him and have him answer your question while it's only forming in your mind and he answers it? I mean, it's um, God. <laughs> There's no other explanation for it. It's God. You know, we have uh, magicians who perform tricks and and have ways of manipulating conversation and people to make it look like they have this quality, but they don't really have it. It's all a trick. I mean, if you just stand there and ask, and, and, and ask him, what am I thinking about? He'll have no idea, but God knows. He knows every thought. He knows what you did. He knows what you're gonna do. He knows every thought, everything that's about you. And there's no place you can go to get away from it. You're in it. <laughs> so you might as well trust Him and give yourself to Him. Worship Him and bow down before Him. Look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, 
uh, verse um, 3 and 4, um, he's, um, he's, he's forgiven a man's sins. And the Pharisees that are standing by um, say, uh, certain of the scribes said, or the scribes are standing by, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this is their thoughts about what he's done, about his forgiving of this guy's sins. This man blasphemes. He can't do this. Who does he think he is forgiving this guy's sins? Only God can do that. You can't do that. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why, Wherefore do you think evil in your hearts? I mean, right then and there, they should have said, Uh-oh, we're in trouble. This guy knows what we're thinking. And we didn't say anything to him. We thought he's blaspheming and he just forgave this guy's sins. And then Jesus goes on to say, well, which is easier to forgive sins or to say to get up and walk? So he commands the guy to get up and walk and he does. He was, you know, laid out, sick of the palsy, unable to walk. Um, and he heals him. That's who we have to deal with. That's who the Lord Jesus is. That's an evidence of his deity, his omniscience. He knows everything, and he knew everything about these people. Well, let's turn back to John chapter 6. We're just going to go through the, uh, John chapter 6, we're going to go through the um, five verses and talk about how the Jews received him. What did they think of this, their reaction? Look at verse 41. The Jews murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. That's the murmur, that's the nasty uh, under your breath, uh, complaining, griping, bitterness, anger, uh, not coming up and talking to the person outright, but doing it uh, so that others will understand that you don't agree with what's being done without ever actually coming out and saying it. They're murmuring against him. Verse uh, 52, uh, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So that there's a fight between them. They're discussing what he's saying and they're not agreeing with it. There's a strife that occurs because of it. In verse 60, many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Hearing the saying means believe it. Who can embrace this? Who can take this in and say that they believe it and that they will live by this and they will understand it and they will uh, comprehend it and they will do it? Um, who could hear this, they say? Who could hear it is, um, is the idea that we're not buying what he's selling. We're not going to take that in. We don't believe that. Um, it's unbelief. It is uh, it's contempt for him. In verse 66, um, he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come to me except it were given to him. I'm sorry, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So uh, they understand at least enough to know that they don't believe what he's saying. They understand his claims to deity, uh, to be the resurrection from the dead to believe in Him, have eternal life, to be the bread that came down from heaven, all these things that He does and knowing their thoughts and answering their thoughts and their hearts before they say anything, they go back, they turn away. They will have none of it. That's the reaction of the Jews. That's the atmosphere in which Jesus uh, uh, ministered. People who were willing to take some of the benefits from him, but unwilling to take him for who he said he was. Coming to him and believing in him and receiving him for eternal life. Look at the reaction of the twelve, um, his twelve disciples. Verse 67, um, Then the Jews said unto the twelve, uh, I'm sorry, then Jesus said unto the twelve, um, Will you go away? Will you also go away? This is not a good day for Jesus. This is, this, is, um, this is rejection by a host of people that he's ministered to, that he's healed, that he's fed, 
that he's proclaimed his deity to, that he has preached the gospel to, and they've rejected him. And he asks his disciples, are you going away also? Uh, are you going to turn away? Um, there's so much unbelief here. There's so many people who are turning away from him. Um, they, you know, in our time, uh, a lot of uh, uh, children and, and, and uh, people before their adolescence make, make profession of faith in Christ. But when they are coming to adulthood um, through the teenage years, uh, they go away because they are not willing to suffer in the name of the Lord Jesus. They're not willing to take the persecution that comes from their peers because they name the name of Christ. They're not willing to be different from them. And uh, uh, the cares of this world encompass them and choke out, um, choke out God's word. Um, this is a valid question. Will you also go away? I mean, do you understand his claims to deity? Do you understand uh, what he's saying here to these unbelievers at Capernaum in the synagogue? And how do you receive it? How, uh, how do you look at the Lord Jesus? Will you go away after you hear this message? After you hear what he's taught at Capernaum and say, I don't want any of that. I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to do what I want. I'm turning my back on that and I'm walking away just like these people did. Look at verse 68. And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's a good question. Where else are you going to go? Nobody else has ever claimed to be the Son of God. I mean, we have people that say, well, I got a revelation from God and I wrote this down and I was kind of the conduit and um, it's not really speaking from me, it's God speaking through me. And um, he made the claim that he was God. There's no denying that. That was his claim. And his 12 disciples, minus one who's going to betray him, his 11, really believe this. Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe it. And we are committed to it. We're sure that you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. What an excellent testimony Peter gives for this group of people. He said it to all of them and Peter answers up. This is what we believe about you. And we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to follow you. Look at John 14. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Haven't memorized this verse? Memorize it. This is Jesus' explanation for who he is. He's the way to God. He is, in his person, truth. Uh, no one comes to God except through him. You have to go through the Lord Jesus. He is the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. Everybody else is on the broad way that leads to destruction. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You want to live? Eat the bread of life. Eat his flesh, drink his blood. Understand his word. Receive it and come to him. No one comes apart from him. Look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, this is um, Peter's defense um, about preaching the Lord Jesus, and he's talking to people who have rejected Christ and had him crucified. And he says of the Lord Jesus, this is the stone, Jesus, which was set at naught by you builders. They were to build the nation of Israel. They were to proclaim God's word. They, uh, they had the responsibility to do this. They set Jesus at naught. In other words, they didn't believe him. They hated him. They had him crucified. They destroyed him, they thought, and in destroying him, they uh, uh, did exactly what God wanted, and, and he forgave sins and rose up from the, from the grave. But they, as builders, set him at naught, uh, discounted him, which has become the head of the corner. So he is the chief cornerstone of the church. 
The building is built upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's square, it's level, it's firm because He is the foundation for it. Our faith rests upon Him. And, and all the apostles and prophets uh, spoke um, His word that they received from Him. And then he goes on to say, Neither is sal there salvation in any other. There's no place else to go. Same thing John 14, 6 says. There's salvation no nowhere else. Where are you going to go to be saved from your sins? It's only in Jesus. Only in Him. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. His name alone saves people. Jesus is salvation. His apostles are having, I mean, His disciples here are having a good reaction to the others who have walked away and will have nothing to do with Him, have turned their back on Him, and they make this good confession. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. we got no place else to go. We're with you. Whatever happens, we're going to be right there with you. We belong to you. So their confession is that He is the Christ. He's the Son of God. He is deity. So the, the last proof of His deity uh, back in John chapter 6, if you turn back there, um, is verse 70 and 71. And, and there uh, Jesus answered um, Simon Peter after He makes this great confession. He says, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So, um, Judas, he says, is a one of you is a devil. <laughs> now, he wasn't the devil literally, but he was in league with the devil. At the, um, um, at the Last Supper, um, Jesus tells that one is going to betray them, and they ask, uh, they, they're looking at each other, and, they're, and, uh, and Peter asked John, who's leaning on Jesus' uh, bosom, to, to ask him who it is. And he says, it's the one I dip the sop into and give to. And he did that with Judas. And um, turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. The disciples looked on one another. They're all sitting around and they're doubting of whom he's, who is he talking about? Who's going to betray him? Now there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's the way John talks about himself. He doesn't name himself. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to, to him, to John, that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. Then the one that was lying on Jesus' breast said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a sop. And when he had dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, into Judas. Then Jesus said to him, What you're going to do, do quickly. So um, it's interesting as, you, as I meditate on this portion of Scripture to look and see that. Even at the Last Supper, Satan was there in attendance. And Satan entered into Judas and betrayed the Lord Jesus. Um, this was the, the disciples' preparation for um, the turmoil that was just about to occur. You know, they go out to the Mount of Olives and they can't even stay awake to pray with Jesus before he's going to be taken. He asks them, stay awake, pray with me. And they can't do it. And then they come and arrest him, and they all leave. They all leave him. They're all scattered. But they're going to come back together, and he's going to appear to them, and their faith is going to be restored, and, um, and they're going to seek after him, and then they're going to boldly proclaim him in the face of the Jews, in the face of the persecution of the Jews, um, in, 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 uh, in threat, under threat of death from them. But... Uh, this is a prophecy, it hasn't occurred yet, of Judas' betrayal of him when Jesus gives this at the Last Supper. It's just about to happen. It'll happen that night, but it hasn't happened. It's his deity. It's his all-knowingness. That's who he is. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for who you are. Thank you for your Son. Thank you for sending him to the earth to be the Savior of all mankind. 
anyone who puts their faith and trust in you can be saved. Uh, for you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Lord, thank you for that offer of the free grace of God given to us by means of the death of Christ. Thank you for his uh, resurrection from the dead. Thank you that at the end of the world he will speak and all men will be raised from the dead, some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. Lord, strike fear into the hearts of those who don't know you yet and who need to turn to you in faith, that they might be delivered from that death, that second death that is to come. Give us faith in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his, his deity, his, uh, his knowing our thoughts, his omniscience, his prophecy about Judas uh, betraying him. Lord, thank you, about, thank you for this chapter in John, and we ask that you'd bless each soul in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, lesson 59, we'll begin with chapter 7 in John and verse 1. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study his word. Here's a, um, a description of the free title we're offering with this lesson. <clears throat> it's Gospel Focus. It's number 25, Gospel Focus, The Necessity of a Pure Gospel. The impurities, additions, and changes which have been introduced into the gospel which is preached today have largely gone, gone unnoticed. We have improved upon the message to make it softer, more palatable, and easier to hear. Hardly anyone notices that the gospel we preach is altogether different from the one which God gave to the New Testament church through the apostles and prophets. Errors have been passed down to us as truth without ever being examined in the light of the scripture. So if you'd like a written copy of, of this title, or if you have questions or comments about this lesson, you can email me at biblestudyvbyv at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study verse by verse.